Okay, time to get started. Right today, uh, this is probably one of the fullest parshas. This is what week thirty-six of the uh, of the year, or the thirty-six parsha of the year. And this is probably the fullest one in the book of Bani Bar. And um, so many interesting stories. And I know tomorrow will be wonderful because I'm going to hit on one small one and leave you with plenty of opportunities to, to talk about the other ones. So what I want to talk about, obviously, well, let's go back. The story, the chapter begins with the, the explanation Moses is to give to Aaron regarding the lighting of the menorah. That's followed by the Levitical priests and the, and the information given to them and talking about the apprenticeship program that they are going to have that's moving on. They're also going to be talking about the second Passover for those that had uh, inability to participate in the first one because of the deaths or whatever have you. Then there's the next section, which deals with the uh, uh, clouds and the fire and the idea of the tabernacle and the two trumpets that would blow is to remind everybody that you're prepared to leave. And then after that, we have Moses talking to Jethro, asking Jethro to become a part of the community. After that, we find out that the Jewish people become a little upset by the choice of food that they're having to de deal with. And so they're asking for all kinds of things. But God will eventually give them quail, so much quail that they will obviously become so sick and vomit from all the quail that he's going to provide for them over the next few weeks. Then we also have the story of the, of the creation of the Sanhedrin. When Moses now places upon 70 elders his spirit, and that spirit which is going to be passed on, but that's also followed by two prophets, Medad and Eldad, and those characters will be not choosing to go to the Sanhedrin meeting, but deciding that they should stay in the camp, and as they do, they begin to prophesy, which angers Joshua because the prophecies apparently deal with the idea that Moses was going to die and that Joshua would be the eventual leader into the land. And finally, we have the story of Miriam and Aaron coming to, uh, Joseph, or to Moses to talk to him about his lack of friendship or fellowship with his wife, the Ethiopian woman. And the problems that will come will be the obvious, the leprosy. And at that point in time, the chapter ends. But I want to talk tonight about my favorite subject, and that's the menorah. I, you know, there's several times that it's come up, but I've, I've just ignored it because I, I find this section to be the most fascinating part of this story. You see, the, the title of the chapter or the title of the Parsha is Baha Alosh. Now, it's easy for me to say, but it doesn't sound very Hebrew. But the, the understanding is, is that this word deals with when you kindle the lamps. And really, my discussion, or what I want to talk about is about the lamps themselves and kindling the lamps and how it relates to us as, as believers in the one true God. And so that's where I want to go tonight. So if you would, please go to... Uh, the book of Numbers, go to the eighth chapter, to the first verse. We're going to do four verses, and that's all we're going to do tonight. That way, Rod has plenty of information that he can give you tomorrow. Oh, you are doing tomorrow, right, Rod? Okay. So anyway, so Rod will have the rest of it. But let's look at those four verses, and then I want to talk about some of the questions I had the first time that I read this story. It begins by saying, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and say to him, when you kindle the lamps towards the face of the menorah, shall the seven lamps cast light. Aaron did so toward the face of the menorah. He kindled the lamps and Hashem had commanded Moses. Now, this is the workmanship of the menorah hammered out of gold from its base to its flower. It is hammered out. 
And according to the vision that Hashem showed Moses, so did he make the menorah. Now, having read all of that, the question becomes, what did Moses tell Aaron? Is all that he said was to make sure you kindle the lamps in the correct direction? What else was there about this story that makes sense? There's something that obviously has to be missing here. It was Moses demonstrating that, well, he could have done it the week before. Remember when they were going through the process of actually um, setting up, taking down, setting up for those five to seven days? He could have shown him then, but all of a sudden it shows up here. And so then the question becomes, why now? Because God doesn't put things out of place. He's the one to obviously organize this whole, whole thing. So I spent a time doing what I call a God search. And I went as far as I could to as many sources as I could to come up with my understandings that I'm going to give you tonight. Now, I need to tell you that, well, I feel impelled to tell you, these are the sources that I use in order to understand what Aaron was really told and why he was told it and what the function of it is. So I used Nachmanides. I used also Rabbi Schneer Zalman, who was the first of the Lubavitcher Jews. I used his son, Rabbi Dov Ber. I used also the sources of, of uh, Yehuda Halevi, who wrote the Kuzar, Kuzari. Then I also had to go to Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. And finally, I went to my favorite, Rabbi Ginsberg. And those became my sources, because you see, there's not a lot of information on these four verses. A lot of it has is, is been orally passed on, but is not in any written form. So I, I went as far as I could to come up with as much as I could understand. So we obviously understand that Aaron is going to be the high priest, which is obvious at this point in time. And Aaron is going to be given the specific job of lighting the menorah. That will be his function daily. Now, we have to understand, when does the menorah get lit? Actually, the menorah gets lit in the evening. Prior to the sun going down, it is lit so that it is there all night. It eventually runs out of oil, they assume, at approximately the time of the next day. And so again, that night, he begins to go through and relight everything. Takes out the what's left of the oil, any wicks that are still, wick parts that are still there. And he begins by reassembling the whole process. Now, when he does so, we one of the things that we look at when we see this and we look at a menorah, we see seven candle wicks would go there and the answer is actually seven times seven each bulb will actually have seven wicks in it all seven of those wicks then are going to be pointed towards a direction and the oil inside is going to flow up into it now my menorah is not exactly like the one that god made now remember moses couldn't figure it out Bezalel couldn't get it done because the gold is too soft. It's impossible to mold this way in order to make the flutes necessary for the oil. So God was the one responsible for making this particular object. And so the, the whole thing is filled with oil. Now you're going to find on this, it talks about the flowers. Well, there's seven or nine flowers on this, on this candelabra. There's also what they call almond buds. And there are 22 of those almond buds. So you now have nine flowers. You have 22 almond buds. And you're also going to have 11, um, well, no, 11 almond buds. Let me try it again. You're going to have 22 almond cups, which are the top. You're also going to have nine or 11 almond buds and nine flowers. This comes from Metahot. 29B and or, you know, 28B and 29A. Now the total number is 42. 
But then we have to add in the seven, which now makes it 49. 49 then becomes a, a number that is common, seven times seven. Well, we're also going to have to see that seven obviously is a number that, the, that is constantly being used. It's always through the, the entire text. Now we just finished the counting of the Omer, seven times seven. We also understand that there were seven laws, the seven laws of Noah. We also understand that Pesach took up seven days. We understood that Sukkot took up seven days. Now there's a lot of other times that the number seven is used, and I'll get into those later. But understand, seven is significant. So I've got 49 parts. And in Hebrew, one thing you can do is you can have your 49 parts, but then you have a whole. So you have 50, which is called the 50 gates of understanding. So our object that we're looking at is about understanding. It is about wisdom of God. So what did Moses tell Aaron about lighting these candles that was so significant, but yet not told. As I go through this, one of the things that began to, to strike me was that the, the kindling of the menorah, as Rabbi Zolman began to tell us, was about also the kindling of a soul. They were, had the same commonality. In fact, as he, as he goes through, he, he makes this statement, and, and I want to read it verbatim. Actually, his son wrote it for him. But it says, the flame surges upward as if to tear free from the wick and lose itself in the great expanses of energy that gird the heavens. But even as it strains heavenward, it is always pulling back, tightening its grip on the wick and drinking thirstily of the oil of the lamp, oil that sustains it continued existence as a individual flame. And it is this tension of conflicting energies, this vacillating from being, being to desolate, to dissolution and back again, that produces the light that we see. Now, when he's talking about this, he, References another verse that's found in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 20, verses 27, which says the soul of a man or the soul of an individual is the candle of God. So Rabbi Zolman, along with the other rabbis, obviously understand that the significance of the menorah was far greater than just simply lighting the lights. It dealt with the soul of man. Now, as we're going through this, then it's going to be necessary for us to understand the process of lighting the menorah, because really that's what he was about. Obviously, he knew the parts. Obviously, he knew the direction in which the wicks had to be placed. And he also understood, oh, by the way, they all were facing into the center, center post. Remember, the, the seven days of the week are actually supposedly reflected in the seven menorahs, with the center one happening to be Shabbat and three to either side, creating a, the idea of, of a syncrasy that goes into this whole process. Now, as we go through this, I, I want you to understand that this, this idea of the soul becomes more and more important because it talks about not only wanting to go to be with God, but it also talks about our needing to be here. You know, there are some days when I wish I was up there and not down here, but then I also have to understand, I really need to be down here. If nothing else for my wife and family, but the idea is the fact that there's a task that's been assigned to us and each and every one of us has the same task. You see, the story is actually about us learning how to light our candles and to light the candles of those who come near us. We're about being lamplighters. That's the idea of the story. And so as we begin, we have to, to look at it from that point of view. Now, you and I probably never thought about this before. I know that Aaron, 
when finally Moses talks to him about lighting the lamps, Aaron was probably very disappointed. At least that's what the rabbis think. Because you remember in, the, in Nassau, just before we started this, each of the tribes brought their offerings to, to God. Twelve tribes brought them. Levi's tribe never did. And they were never wanting to, never supposed to. Now, I can imagine Aaron would have felt slighted. And maybe that's not quite the right word. But the understanding is that Aaron himself wanted to participate in that whole thing. But God has Moses. Moses, you're going to do something far more important. You're going to light the candles. And so Moses then, having given him the description, having told him how to do it, we now find that the fact that he is wanting him to understand the idea of this illumination, this godly light that's being placed in the menorah and put into his hands and the hands of all of the people to light the light of another candle. Now, we know that if you just simply light a wick, that the wick will burn for a while, not intensely, but it will. And then it goes out. And I know that if you tried to light oil, oil doesn't burn easily. And so lighting the oil is not an, an easy process. But what is the process when they're combined together? And that's asking the question, well, if we're all supposed to be lamp lighters, what's our wick? What's our oil? Rabbi Menachem Schneerson began to teach, or at least that's where I found it, the idea that together the oil is the Torah. The wicks were the commandments that we were responsible for obeying. The mitzvot, the things that we do in order to not so much please God, although that's our, our intentions, but to minister not only to God, but to each other, to do the right thing. And so when we light a candle, when we light the menorah, it is the same thing as us lighting the flames of another person. That's what we're trying to do. Now, the purpose then obviously is illumination. So in illuminating something, God commands his Aaron to light the candles of the menorah by saying the word, which I had a wonderful time pronouncing, Baha Alakot, Lakota. Again, back to the very beginning, what does it mean? When we go back to understanding its meaning, we find out that it says, when you kindle the lamp. It's not if you kindle a lamp. It's when you. So in other words, there's an imperative from the very beginning. Now, Aaron, for what, 38 plus years, said that every day as he lit the candles. Now, I'm sure by then he's pretty well got it in his mind. But the question is, when you and I think about it, since I'm mentioning to you for the first time, probably many of you hadn't thought of it this way. The question is, when you come near to another soul, what do you say? Now, you may not say it out loud, but the question is, how does one act to ignite the soul of another? That's really what's going on. So God made this command. Now, he says, we are to remain, or actually, he says to Aaron, you're to remain near to the candle with your flame until it is finally lit. Now, what does it mean to finally be lit? The understanding is lit to the point where it can sustain itself. Lit to the point that it can sustain itself. When we draw near to other people, the question is, how long do we stay? That's the question. 
How long do we stay? How long do we attempt? Now, some people, the attempt isn't going to be long because they're not interested. But every one of us knows enough of the scripture to be able to help someone else to cause their candle to remain lit. Now, Rabbi Haleva, who wrote the Kazari, one of the things he's talked about was the fact that the candle waves. He's ever watched the flame, it flickers. Well, he compared that same flicker to the Jewish life of prayer. You know, when a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, I would have to think, stands to pray, you often see them daven, bend forward, move back and forth. One of the nice things I have thought of in Texas, besides the fact that it's 99 million degrees down here, is the fact that the wind blows. And we have these great big tall pine trees outside our house. And I sit in my kitchen and I sit there and watch them blow back and forth. And I think of God davening each and every one of those trees as they bow to God. The same thing that you and I do when we go to pray. The same idea that, that, that goes on there. So the flickering of the candle is, a, is, a, is the flickering of a soul. And it's our responsibility to, to, well, I shouldn't say it's our responsibility. God would love us to draw near to somebody to light that flame. Now, the word for flame in Hebrew is shel havet, shel havet. Now, the value of the word shel havet is 737. No big deal, except in Jewish understanding, numbers are not insignificant. And so we have to find a place where the value of 737 appears again. Remember I talked about davening? Three times a day, a Jew will pray the Shema. The Shema. And there comes a point in the prayer when he talks and he asks, speaks about the idea of one should love the Lord their God with all their heart. Do you know the rest of it? The value of that those phrases is 737 by coincidence, by coincidence. Now, the idea of love, it's in the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6, where Solomon says, the epitome of love is the flame of God the flame of God. Divine wine requires a wick, a human body, to channel the substance and to convert it into illuminating light. Now, there must be physical minds that study, and you do. That's why you tune in is because you've been studying and you want to go farther in the parshas. The idea is that, that we study, physically study. We physically talk about what we're studying. The idea, if you were to go to a, 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 a yeshiva, is to watch two men sitting there, totally immersed in the conversation of the Talmud or verse from scripture, totally involved, back and forth, totally emerging themselves. And when you see that, the, the, well, while I was in Israel, I got a chance to, to go to a, the house of a famous heart surgeon. And his son and I spent time talking about David. And in our conversation, we got so loud. And here we are just sitting here, the two of us, and there's eight to 10 other people in the room. But as I looked at his face, and I hope as he looked at mine, you would have seen that we were, he was illuminated. He had lighted himself up by studying and talking about the word of God. 
Now, we also have to understand that mitzvot are important because that's about God's divine will. He wills that we do the right thing. That begins the whole thing. So divine oil cannot produce light without a material wick, us. Neither can the wick sustain the flame without oil, Torah and mitzvot. But life without Torah and mitzvot is not capable of sustaining anything. Now, to read